other again. I'm currently working on Amplifier. Uh, this here is actually an Amplifier built myself. It's based on the uh, Legend Stage Master MK2. A link for that thing will be in the bottom. It's a pretty neat project uh, that some guy made. Actually, a professor really. And he included everything you need. Everything. The entire schematics, what parts you need, and whatnot. Even the whole thing to make the entire board, really. Now, this, I made two boards because, well, um, I need stereo. This is just a mono amplifier, just that has a total of eight MOSFETs in it. And this one works just fine. Now, since I built two, um, yeah, for whatever reason, this one just doesn't work. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, and I currently have damaged the board so far that it is kind of hard to like to really do any more um, troubleshooting on it. And since I had uh, initially some issues with this because the board kind of started to catch fire as soon as I uh, powered it up, um, I kind of just gave up on this one and I decided, hey, I'm just going to make the whole board again new. The reason why there are only like two MOSFETs in here is, well, um, you have to set up this board specifically. Uh, that is what these two uh, potentiometers here are for. So uh, that you have everything set up correctly, like the bias current and the speaker output voltage. Um, you don't want to have any voltage on there and the bias current should be like really low. Because yeah, you don't want this thing drawing unnecessary power when it's not doing anything. So, well, what's what's wrong? I don't know. It sounds terrible and uh, currently I'm not getting any audio out of it anymore. So, I just kind of thought, ah, fuck it. So, uh, well, what did I do? Well, I printed out the uh, negative for the board. I hope that is the uh, proper negative. And, uh, yeah, this is uh, what will get... Uh, be transferred onto a PCB, which is this one. And that one will be etched until we have our proper traces that we need. And well, that's the whole thing, really. <laughs> Pretty easy to do. Yeah, I've got all the chemicals I need, and uh, it really is a pretty simple concept to do. And it, it just doesn't like require any real effort, it's just kind of a bit of annoying, and you have to be careful with the time. All right, so I'm going to move all this to the kitchen now because I don't want to mess up my workbench with these uh, chemicals and have a big nice surface that I can easily clean. So if something spills, it's not really much of an issue because I just clearly do not want to have like um, etching solution in my keyboard or anywhere. So uh, let's move everything there, shall we? All right, so as you can see, I have glued my paper here that has the print on it onto, well, just the uh, copper uh, plate. You have to watch out that this is actually like uh, mirrored, otherwise you will have a, well, mirrored um, transfer, and that would be, well, bad. So what we've got to do now is we have to iron this onto here. This paper that I'm actually using is a catalog from Reichelt, that's a uh, German uh, electronics provider, and uh, fun fact, the paper that they have in their catalog actually has superb qualities for doing the uh, toner transfer method for, well, transferring the toner onto a uh, PCB like this. I mean, I've done it multiple times before and it always works well. I just maybe need a more powerful uh, iron. 600 watts, mm, yeah, that barely does it. I need way more. Maybe 1200 to 2000, that should do. Alright, so as you can tell, we are in the kitchen. I'm using the stove top because, well, it can handle the high temperatures of the iron without, uh, well, breaking really. Or, uh, yeah, I couldn't really do that with the uh, wood over here <laughs> because, well, yeah, it's not really that great to use this high temperatures on that. Alright, so, well, what we do now is, well, I have my thing here taped to the board. So what I do now is I take a uh, cloth, lay that on top of it, and now this is not going to be a crappy magic trick. As you can see we have our thing under here. Now the reason why I'm using the cloth is because, well, 
There may be some internal residue on the back side or we just don't want our iron to stick to the paper. We just want this uh, to get really, really hot and with that we can apply pressure evenly to this. Because, well, the way the laser gets on there is, uh, well, we make it hot, the laser gets transferred onto the paper, also through some uh, statics, and uh, we are pretty much doing the reverse by just heating it up so much that it melts and binds with the surface of the board. So, well, that's what we've got to do now. Now this will take a while, so yeah. Gonna do a jump cut now. Because you probably don't want me see me doing this here for like 10 minutes since this is a like really big board. As you can see it's already flattening and you can already start to see the toner shining through the to the bottom, which is good, so that means it's starting to work. But it will take a lot longer. Well, I changed some stuff around. I'm not using the uh, cloth anymore because I don't need it anymore. Uh, as you can tell, if I... well, I can't barely... so it's steaming like crazy. But we can see that our toner is already starting to stick pretty good onto the board. There, as a fine, very fine line down there, as you can see. So, it's starting to separate from the paper. Now, in order to help that, or a little bit faster, I got some... I got a wet cloth here. And I'm always adding some water to this because, well, first of all, it will spread the heat a lot uh, better when I use the iron on the board. And I'm also trying to well, hope uh, to try and get the paper to really separate uh, from the toner, ma hopefully making it uh, this whole process a lot easier. Now this is actually not an iron that you should like you really use on like wet surfaces or so because well <laughs> it's not really designed for steam but uh, it can't handle it. Well and it will also help you to well identify uh, which sections you haven't heated up so far. It's most issue is for me the corners because well this is such a small iron. It's kind of hard to really transfer all that heat into the uh, well, corners and edges of this board. Actually, I'm going to place it on the rack now because water keeps getting underneath the board, making this whole thing a little bit annoying. But as you can already tell, the paper is starting to lose its, well, structure, really. So that means I should probably be able to, if in the best case, just peel it off without making it wet again. Or well, the worst case, I just have to submerge the whole thing in water and just wait for this thing to soak itself so much that it just comes off right immediately. Yeah, that already sticks really well. And it, it seems to be... Oh, it's hot. Yeah, that seems to be actually uh, working pretty good with the um, water on it. So what, I, I would actually just be able to peel this off right now without even having to make any water on it. I'm gonna give it one more go, but this time just a little bit of it because I probably had too much in the last go. Again. And then just let this whole thing submerge in water until the paper gets so wet that you can just well, peel it away. Probably could really do that right now since, well, yeah. And it's what well, it seems to have worked pretty well already. Alright, since this is done. So I'm going to take this without burning myself since it's really hot. Yeah, I have this tray filled up with hot water. Let's submerge the board in there. Leave it for 
I don't know, 10 to whatever minutes. I'll just forget about it and come back later to it and then, well, slowly start peeling away the uh, paper. Or maybe it peels itself away, in the best case, so, which it sometimes already does. But yeah, now it's time to wait. That worked pretty well. I'm just gonna let this thing dry because, well, uh, there's still some paper residue on here and I wanna know exactly where it is. Because it can easily happen that this small piece of paper or a little bit of ink that shorts out between uh, some of the pads and you don't want that to happen on your final product when you are done with the etching. It's always a good idea to uh, double check everything, make sure that nothing is somewhere where it shouldn't be, take uh, the original print of this, lay it next to it, uh, not flipped, of course, and uh, make sure that the layout you see here matches up exactly with that one. Now you can probably tell the reason why we flipped this in before printing it, because, well, otherwise this section here would have been over there and the whole board would have been mirrored. And yeah, that would kind of mess up a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, you would really, really don't want that to happen uh, <laughs> and realize it when you've finished etching, because you've just produced junk that you can't use anymore. Just a little bit over there. But yeah, I think the etching should take care of the paper as well. Alright, here we go with the board again. Now, I'm not sure why it has this weird discoloration on it, but that shouldn't matter. It's probably just the top layer of the copper that looks a bit weird. But, yeah. Uh, I always put the board in the oven just so the toner gets burnt really uh, onto the board and has no chance of getting off easily. Like I said right now, and we can see we have a small bridge right up there. So we have to remove some paper there when this thing has cooled down. But other than that, everything on here seems to be alright. So yeah, could start and try to prep the uh, chemistry bath for this thing. Yay! Right, it's etching time. I only have this plastic tray which is like way too big, so I have it tipped at an angle so that I don't have to pour in as much liquid. So I can, because well the board it just fits in here like this, and I just need this front section like ready to be filled. I don't need the whole thing. Alright, so the etching solution which I'm using is iron 3 chloride. I used this a couple of times and it still works just fine. I mean you can use this as long as you want to until it just kind of just stops working. But yeah, this is some really nasty stuff as you can already tell. Usually you should use gloves. I don't have any gloves at the moment so I'm gonna do it without gloves. Oh well. Let's pour some of this in here, shall we? This stuff is also really, really heavy and dense. So be careful how you handle that. You really do not want to spill this stuff. I need something else to put under here because that's not working. I think that's already more than enough than I actually need. So what we do now is we take our board that we have checked where everything is fine, flip it upside down and just gently lay it on top of the uh, liquid if we can because usually it just kind of always sinks to the bottom like so and keep it like this for well let's say ten, check it in a few minutes. Tapped a few times to release any air bubbles trapped underneath it. And if it sinks, well, it sinks. And make sure if you don't have any gloves like me, have some water and everything really near you so you, if you get some of the stuff on your hands you can easily clean everything up again. So yeah, now we wait. Alright, so 10 minutes have passed and as you can see and look at the board closely, you can see the uh, traces actually shining through. Now that's good because that means it's it's we're done. We we have completed our goal. So let's get this board out of here. Yeah, you should really not touch this stuff. It's it's really nasty. And take a look at it. Make sure that everything on the board looks proper. And so far it does. I'm just gonna go ahead and give this board a wash. 
Alright, that actually looks really good so far, but I would kind of like to leave this board in for another 5 minutes or so because we have some issues like right here, as you can probably tell there is some uh, copper between these two uh, pads here and some of the holes haven't formed properly and we also have some more copper right there. That could just be because maybe some of the uh, paper was still stuck in there, but I don't think so really. So, yeah, I mean, you could just always scratch that away and done. But, yeah, I'm just gonna leave in this board for another five minutes and we'll have a look at it there then. Alright, so this already looks a lot better. As you can see, we don't have as much copper stuck in those places as before. But since there's still a little bit left down here, for example, and I'm kind of worried about that, you know, shorting some stuff out. If you actually start to solder, and it could it could cause some bridging or so, and it could there could also be some more stuff on this board. And have a closer look at it. But yeah, that already looks a lot better. I'm gonna put it in there just a few minutes more just until this uh, copper right down here is all gone. I mean, the traces are so big, if it would start to itch a little bit too much, it wouldn't really matter. So, see you again in a bit. Alright, another few minutes have passed. Let's have another look at this. Yeah, again, use gloves for this. Don't use your fingers, this stuff is nasty and it stains. Right, time to wash the board. There we go, that's our board. Alright, so there doesn't seem to be any uh, copper residue or anything like that left on here anymore. That looks really, really good actually so far. So, yeah, I think that I can use this. I can totally use this. So what I've got to do now is clean this board with um, acetone or a nail polish to get the uh, toner off. Because, yeah, as you can probably tell, there is no way of getting that black stuff, which is now covering the copper, off of this thing. Damn birds, always making noise when I want to do a video. Oh well. Alright, so as you can see, we are almost finished. Now we have to get some rid of the toner that's on here. Now, uh, for that, we will need some acetone. Yes, uh, rubbing alcohol won't do anymore. This is like the it's really intense stuff for this. Best to uh, have good ventilation for this, because that stuff will really make you dizzy. So, for that, simply, well, we just add some acetone on a paper cloth and uh, clean the whole board right off. Should work really well. Stuff smells awesome. And you want to make sure you get the whole thing really really clean because you don't want to have any toner residue left over on the board because that's just gonna ruin your day when you're trying to solder this then. Just gonna take a short break here. So as you can see, that looks really nice, and just like magic, the circuitry that we wanted is there. Yeah, well, not really magic. It's pretty simple and straightforward. As you can tell, it's super easy to do your own circuit boards, and uh, yeah. My biggest issue was usually these traces, these really thick ones, because on the last board I couldn't get enough thermal mass into those. So yeah, that kind of ended up with... Uh, really big holes in here and I had to uh, redo that with a uh, text marker well not really a text marker, with a with a sharpie really just so that uh, the iron 3 chloride wouldn't eat away the entire uh, section here well I'm already getting dizzy from the acetone that's good Alright, I think I got most of it off. Just gonna give it another go. Just to make sure that there's no like toner residue left on it. And then we have a look a closer look at the board and make sure that there are no traces that shouldn't be there. 
All right. Let's close that. So tell me for even more easy from this stuff. Beautiful. There we go. That is our socket board. That's exactly how it should look like. Um, I don't see any traces that shouldn't belong anywhere. Everything seems to be in the right place. And uh, yeah, this seems to be a very, very successful uh, attempt at making a uh, socket board. A lot better than, well, my previous attempts, because, yeah, I kind of had the issue that, uh, well, I ate away some of the, uh, uh, well, the toner didn't stick properly here, so I ate away some of the uh, traces really here, and I kind of had to bridge those with uh, the stuff you will batteries together with. So, yeah. But, uh, nevertheless, this one here still works, and you can see that there are, like, a small... Uh, Places still left, but this was like one one of the uh, very first boards I've ever made myself. Really, I made some before, but those uh, involved using a Dremel and uh, cutting away all of the uh, material you don't need. Uh, but yeah, that is also the reason why I tinned these boards like entirely. Well, just to make sure that I have proper contact on this. And uh, yeah, this one here unfortunately doesn't work. And I could just go for the effort of pulling off all the components and putting new ones on. But, yeah, the board is kinda ruined since I've done that a lot on this one and I kinda just say, well, really, fuck it. Uh, let's do this all again. And yeah, there you go. That's the guy who designed it. And that's uh, how the thing is actually called, the Legend Stage Master. A pretty powerful uh, amplifier, if you can get it to work properly, like this one here, that uh, will deliver up to 250 watts of power, if you have the proper heat sinking on this. Now I just added these heat sinks to the MOSFET that got the most warm, so uh, I can operate this thing for a few minutes at least, to do like all the calibration stuff and everything. Because the heat sinks and orders still haven't arrived yet, it's been over two months. Oh well. Sellers said they sent some new ones out. Let's hope uh, that they will arrive soon, because I would really, really like to finish this and actually make it operational so that I can run it for hours and not only minutes, just so that the MOSFETs won't blow up. Oh well, but yeah, uh, already tested this one and damn, this is an awesome circuitry. Again, I put in the link and everything to all this stuff in the description below there. So if you want to build one of these yourself, feel free to do. This is really, really an awesome, easy to make uh, amplifier, uh, if it works, <laughs> at least, yeah. Well, I had some success and yeah, no success, since this thing will pretty much just caught fire as soon as I plugged it in. Um, no clue why really, I'm pretty sure that the layouts were the same. Maybe I uh, mixed up something or one of the uh, transistors or MOSFETs was broken that arrived. Oh well. So yeah, that was how to make your own circuit boards. Or how I make my own circuit boards, really. So well, thank you for watching and goodbye. Alright, so this is the amplifier. As you can tell, it's definitely not finished. We are missing like the knob here and every those cables going in and out of it. But I have got the board that works right there. And yeah, I can operate it a long time because otherwise the MOSFET will get crazy hot. I've got a 100 watt speaker hooked up to it. So yeah, we can demonstrate some of the power at least that, that it has. So, well, let's power this thing up. The power circuitry all works in this. This thing runs off an old microwave transformer that I modified and added a, another secondary to it. So that's how I get the uh, power for this thing, because it runs on 70 uh, volts and negative 70 volts. I get about 140 volts total, and I'm just sort of doing a voltage divider because I have two coils on the uh, transformer, really, and a big, uh, big rectifier in it. Yeah. Let's power this thing up. Now, it hums a little bit, but it 
the rattling really comes from the stuff that is lying on top of it. Otherwise, in that it just hums very faintly. It's just because of the stuff that's laying like you're really on top of it. All right, fix the humming issue a little bit. Um, that humming is always there, but it will go away if you actually use the amplifier and put it on a load. I currently have the speaker not connected to it because, well, it makes a huge, huge bang when you switch it on. So I've got the speaker now hooked up to it. I'm definitely going to add some speaker protection to this. This is something you should usually do on a uh, amplifier, but uh, I kind of didn't add that till now. It's just a relay that switches on the speaker outputs delayed, if you like, two or three seconds delayed. But yeah, uh, let's go and play some copyright free music from the YouTube Auto Library and give it a listen. So yeah, that works just fine and it works really well. The preamplifier I'm using in this is just a uh, valve regulated uh, headphone amplifier. Really, uh, nothing really too complicated for this. Because, well, it is a preamplifier, but you just hook headphones up to it, so yeah. Oh well, um, the view meters currently they don't work, but they are uh, powered up and they will work, but I just haven't hooked up the audio signal for this whole thing. Yeah, this thing pulls quite a bit of power, it's a bit power hungry, and in the end, well, it, the whole assembly here will pull about 560 watts. Let's uh, say 580 because of the, uh, the efficiency of the transformer, really. It pulls six, uh, almost 60 watts while doing nothing. That's just because of the transformer. It's, using a microwave transformer is a good idea because it's big enough to power it and it can definitely power it. But the problem is they are really not efficient so it burns away quite a bit of power by just doing nothing at all. So yeah. 